Hi, and welcome everyone to the latest CTO Craft Bytes. Today, we'll be looking at how to streamline and improve your agile team's delivery, improve throughput and productivity, and generally get better and releasing value more frequently. If this is your first time at CTO Craft, let me tell you a little bit more about this group. CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. The community numbers are over 1,350, so, and we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring groups, an online community, and events like this one. Uh, huge thanks to our headline partner today, AWS, for helping making these Bytes events happen. So I'm uh, MC in this Byte session today. I'm Glenn Roberts, the CTO of Digital Solutions at iTech Art. Um, let me introduce our first speaker today, who is Giles Lindsay. Um, he is the CTO and also the founder of Agile Delta, a business agility consultancy, a long-term Angelist and enterprise Agile coach, a member of the advisory council of the PMI Disciplined Agile Consortium. So welcome, uh, Giles. Nice to have you here. Uh, please tell us a short piece of information about yourself. Thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah, look, for me, I think you pretty much sort of summed up who and what and where I am. I've uh, been on the, my Agile journey for sort of nearly coming up 20 years and um, uh, really passionate about responsible leadership, really passionate about trying to help other people in the community uh, change sort of systemic organizational designs, ways of working uh, to really get the best out of uh, organizations. Great to have you here. Thanks. Um, next, I'll introduce Emily Weber, um, Agile and delivery, a digital delivery consultant, coach, trainer, and speaker, author of Building Successful Communities of Practice, passionate about people, communities, and learning. So welcome, Emily. Could you also give us a short introduction about yourself? Yes, thanks for having me here. Uh, so yes, I'm Emily. <laughs> I'm an independent Agile Etc. 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 I my main focus is around people, how people connect with each other, people collaborate um, around teams. Um, you mentioned communities of practice; that's a big passion of mine. So, sort of how people uh, collaborate in a more decentralised way, uh, and increasingly uh, in the in work in the era of growing capability as well. Uh, I also have many, many side projects, so uh, I know lots of people from running various meetups, <laughs> various things like diversity charter, um, and uh, pop popping up all over the place. Right, excellent to have you here. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jenny Martin, a consultant, trainer, facilitator, and coach specialising in agile deliver delivery, quality, improvement, and serious play. So welcome, Jenny. Please also give us a short introduction about yourself. Um, hi, yeah. Uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so yes, I've, I've never had a background in kind of IT delivery and agile stuff for about twenty years. But my main focus and where I tend to work is um, really in in terms of helping teams collaborate really well together. And I'm I'm really most motivated by I guess teams and individuals being able to reach their potential and flourish. And all that good stuff that happens when you get all that wonderful individuality coming together where teams can kind of do really awesome things so so that's where i tend to do most of my work okay, fantastic so great to have you all here um so for the audience uh please add your questions at any time from the ask a question link uh, just below the video um i will be keeping an eye on them and adding them in when they're relevant during the current conversation and then we'll go through the rest um once we've gone through the initial set of questions uh, so let's talk about Generation Agile. So uh, Giles, Generation Agile, I've not really come across that term before. So could you tell us who General Agile is, uh, Generation Agile is, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's certainly not my phrase, but it is a phrase that I'm using more and more often in conversations, uh, especially with organizations, especially um, when talking to that executive group within organizations as well. We, our generation agile okay so we the we're the people that have lived and breathed it um you could say possibly since the manifesto was created in 2001 but also predominantly you know the the, the mindset and the approach and lean principles have been around for a lot longer but essentially we're the ones over that last sort of 19 20 years who have experienced all the highs and the lows, the, the peak of inflated, inflated expectation, the troughs of disillusionment, uh, you know, using the Gartner vernacular um, of Agile, and you know, all the successes and failures we've had along the way over those 19 years. You know, and I've certainly uh, worked in those organizations that have had both. Uh, and from my perspective, 
what I'm trying to do, and why I had the conversation, obviously, with yourself uh, and Andy Skipper from CTO Craft, was around wanting to sort of uh, start getting communities to think smarter about their agile adoptions. What does it mean within their organizations? Because that next generation, that's generation virtual, I don't know, generation working from home, whatever comes next within the next 10 years beyond agile, um, I really want them to be sort of working in a way where they're not suffering that sort of same friction that I had in the large part of my career with that command and control, that some of that bureaucracy, some of that micromanagement that comes from those sort of older school style organizations as well. So it's talking about Generation Agile. We, everybody here today is Generation Agile. And it's our responsibility to move beyond that and help change the norms we have today, which aren't working. And you've heard all the amazing things, you know, both Emily and Jimmy just talked about and the things that they're passionate about involving, involving change to happen as well. It's exactly that. We need to do a lot more of this. We should have done stuff um, like this probably 10, 15, if not 20 years ago, right at the creation and the... Uh, the um, start of the Agile movement post the manifesto creation. Yet somehow we've only really been having these serious conversations about, you know, really removing that friction within the last sort of four or five years properly in that as a sort of a more global community based level. And uh, as you mentioned there, the Agile Manifesto, uh, 19 years ago, getting released. Um, Jenny, um, with your experience, could you describe how teams and leadership have changed over the last 20 years? Um, yeah, I mean, there really seems to be a proper change happening that I've noticed in terms of the focus on people. So, I mean, for me, it's always been true. I've always, I've always led in the same way, you know, for the last 20 years, I've always felt um, compassionate about people and, and wanted people on my team to feel happy and be themselves and and I and I've kind of wanted them to do their best by facilitating that kind of environment. But 20 years ago, when I started out in my kind of consultancy journey, I remember in my in my review being told you're never ever going to make it as a senior leader because you're not enough of a insert rude word here because, because I'm not in, not ruthless enough not hard enough and I would have kind of um even after that so even 10 to 15 years ago people would say to me um, yes Jenny we hear you but this is a business issue it's not that fluffy peopley stuff you keep talking about and I was like but no this is the business you know it's the same thing I'm trying to help this business be successful I think I don't know whether it's a female thing or you know certainly back 15, 20 mm -hmm. years ago there was a model of how you needed to get on by kind of being a bit ruthless and maybe being a bit command and control. And and on my teams, I remember uh, some of my colleagues and and people more senior to me almost a bit suspicious of my team because we were all quite happy and doing well. Like I had some this weird lady witchcraft thing that was going on um when really we were just kind of listening to each other and supporting each other and being nice and trusting each other and all of those kinds of things so i spent the first 15 years um keeping my psychology degree like a secret like i'm not i haven't got an it degree i've got this psychology degree it's some kind of dirty secret just don't tell anybody whereas now it's kind of like oh, i've got a psychology degree you know and um, people completely opposite. You know, I now I go into conversations with senior leaders of quite um, traditional organisations, and they're asking me, "Do you know anything about psychological?" <laughs> and I'm thinking, "My goodness, things have things have changed." So, yeah, I think agile practices, because of the self-organising teams and the autonomy and the things that came in there, have really started to change uh, the way that we think about. Uh, people and leadership and it's now sort of pushing almost the HR practice so it, it's it's progressive now in a way that um, other industries even that, that aren't that aren't kind of tech industry are taking the practices used within agile around people and and setting the new the new kind of norm and there's all loads of great stuff like um, wonderful book managing for happiness that I read a few years ago and I just feel like, oh yes, this is. I've been saying this for years and years. So it it 
really is changing, I think. Really is, finally. Thank goodness. <laughs> And the point you mentioned there about the command and control, I think is really interesting. Those of us with partners outside of the tech industry, especially during this COVID crisis, are seeing that businesses are really struggling for that um, people management skill, the care about them, especially when you're having to ask your member of staff to go into the office during the middle of a pandemic. Um, or even afterwards, even though the lockdowns come out, a lot of people don't feel as comfortable around it anymore. Um, so I'd say, Emily, what would you view as the biggest impact of change for teams during this COVID-19 crisis? So um, I I'm going to point slightly to uh, the last question uh, as well, in that um, I think uh, I, I think uh, I think I was feeling a bit glass half empty whilst you were being very glass half full, <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> Where I'm like, yes, except for in here and here and here, <laughs> um, because I I was having uh, actually just having conversations this week about um, organisations where people people grow up emulating the leaders of the past um, and breaking out of that is is quite difficult to do. And although uh, lots of us are used to um, products and services that are very in, in their nature agile because you know that we've got a new software update all the time when they, sometimes when they go into the office that kind of all goes out the window um, so it's heartening to see where leaders do change and disheartening to see where it just continues on in the same fashion as it has been I think the the, the COVID-19 and the suddenly everybody's working from home has has two sides of it again and those organisations that have uh, do have psychological safety and have trust in their people are finding that they're able to thrive, are finding that some of the hierarchical, physical hierarchical boundaries have been broken down by the fact that, you know, everybody is in the same screen space, um, are thriving really well. And those that don't have that and don't have the trust, um, it's making it much harder for people because they are um, expected to be online all the time and i would be fascinated i'm uh, fascinated to see which uh, what what has what does stick because it, um the pandemic has forced some organizations to uh, do things like you know taking entire call centers online where before you know a number of months ago it was impossible people can't work from home and suddenly everybody can work from home and some precedents have been set um so uh Keeping some of that, or having some of that continue, would be um, be really interesting. But I'm slightly sceptical about what will stick and what won't stick. Sure. And Jenny, do you have any other views on uh, how things have changed in the like in the recent future? Yes, yeah, so I, I think kind of just to, to mirror what what Emily's saying there, it's had to catapult some, I guess, less trusting managers and leaders into a position where they have to, have to trust. The people who are working from home so maybe they weren't a fan of it before or had you know feeling nervous about letting people go and do um work without without being visible so i think there's some going to be some really good stories coming out of that where people get to demonstrate that they can do really good work without that sort of close supervision um and it the other way as well i've got a friend who's now been asked to log her time every day rather than every week because they want to keep a closer eye somehow on on what she's doing but i guess the thing i really like about it which which i've seen has changed is this kind of disarming um the professional norms a little bit so i'm a firm believer that in order to, to be the best we can be and get the most out of ourselves and each other is to really just be ourselves without a veil of kind of professionalism or you know however you should be that you should be your whole self and and, and kind of reveal reveal that as, as much as you want to without fear of being somehow kind of not putting in. So I love I love it when um, kids are hanging off people's laps in meetings where um, you know senior people turn up with their in their pajamas. You know, um, I absolutely love that. I think that has to has to uh, make us more human and um encourage people to be themselves and not just be a work person or a home person um so i love that part of it i hope that that is something that uh, continues i think just to, to add to that i think it's there's some the thing that i would like to see uh more of and see how people deal with this is the uh the serendipitous type interactions that happen and 
making sure that people um, uh, making sure that people aren't just meeting to talk about work because we, we don't do that in a work environment um, and replicating that or replicating the you know wandering around the office and seeing what's on people's boards uh, and stopping someone and having a conversation uh, be interesting to see what uh, what happens in that space and, and what people run with absolutely um, so Giles, how do you see agile teams leaderships uh, changing going like moving it forward even further post this um, COVID-19 crisis? Uh, I mean, great question. Um, norms have changed, all right? We, uh, upheaval on a global scale, economic, global, personal, whatever scale, right? None of us have ever experienced like this anything in our lives ever. I, you know, my neighbor that way is, is 90 years old, went, lived through the war, you know, and never was in a, in a position where living in London during the Blitz, she was actually locked down. She would have to go to a bomb shelter. But, you know, uh, apart from that, she'd come up and still be able to walk around and still interact and have that sense of community and everything else. There's been some amazing positives, both of which Jenny and Emily have talked about, as well as there are lots of negatives, though, that have come out of this. Um, a lot of mental health challenges still that need to be surfaced and opened up and talked about openly as well. Uh, recent polls that a lot of places now are starting to do, newspapers, um, the um, Harvard Business Review and things like that, where they're actually calling out uh, and asking people, you know, um, do you want to stay working from home in these new norms? And a recent poll on LinkedIn, there was 1,200 respondents, 77% said they wanted to go back into the workplace, even with the, the risk and the, the understanding that some of that social distancing still needs to be there. But they want that sense of community. They want to go back to have that bonding. I think sort of, you know, uh, Emily was talking about where they want to be able to go and have lunch. They want to be able to go and have some of that social stuff, which isn't just about work. And a lot of people I'm talking to as well are missing their commute. Um, as well, going in and out of an office, you're, you're kind of forced, for want of a better word, when you're on a train or in a car or whatever, um, and you're going, say, for example, me going into Waterloo and to London every day, and, and the idea that you have to be on that train for 45, 50 minutes and you get your headphones on and you're reading a book, you have that time to mentally check into the day and mentally check out. And you can read books. My reading has plummeted. I mean, Jenny's given me a, a list. I've bought one off the list and started reading it. But, you know, uh, that my book list is, is growing and the amount of reading I'm doing is diminishing. The amount of podcasts I'm listening to is diminishing as well. And I know from talking to a lot of people, a lot of people in the teams, old teams that I used to be responsible for as well, um, kind of going, yeah, we're, we're missing that social inclusivity, that social interaction. It's phenomenal to have this, but our world really is this sort of this world of being in this box here. And that is it, having these calls, having these Zoom events. And a lot of people seem to be working harder. I think to whoever was talking about booking their time daily instead of weekly, it's because people are sort of starting at 8.30 and working right the way up to 6.00. And uh, we, without sometimes that sort of real mental checkout of being able to go off and do other things. And I hear people kind of, I've got to get on my Zoom call, otherwise I'll be late. And it's this sort of phrenicity of, uh, uh, in their lives. And yet I'm kind of going, come on, no one's going to worry whether you're a couple of minutes late to this thing um, as we get the, the, the meeting set up and get going, just like you know people here today. Um, I, I genuinely think we've taken some fantastic things um, from the learnings of lockdown. Um, this blurring of our lives, our personal life and our work life, professional life. You know, I, I was talking to someone yesterday who I said, you know what, if we had met in person, you would have come to my office in a business suit, this, this woman I was talking to, and, you know, you would have come with your laptop and everything else and we would have done this formal presentation uh, and so on and so forth. And I said, now we're, we're sat here in our t-shirts and shorts, the cat's walking past, the children are running in, you know, to the point TC's written up here, you get to see people for who they are, get to see the real person behind the role. You do. That blurring, that, that, that personal life, professional life is just one now. We're, we're just people who obviously need to do a job, need to create those successful business outcomes for whoever we're working for, delighting those organizations. But at the same time, we're people and we have this personal life as well. Okay. 
Excellent. So we've got questions coming in from the audience already. So let's just uh, touch on them before we start looking at the future. Um, one of the first questions is, how can you design water cooler moments? Um, one of the guests just spoke to this. So, yeah. So how would you go about trying to keep that community spirit in this type of um, environment that we're in right now? So the things, uh, so I have a, a term that I used on a blog post a little while ago, which was assisted seren serendipity, which is a term that I stole from, uh, oh God, where did I steal it from? Maybe Hootsuite, I'm not sure, I need to check. Um, and uh, this is creating the environment for them, those moments to happen. So I know that, so Hootsuite did a big post a while back about random coffee. So random coffee is a, is a brilliant thing. Uh, where you're paired up randomly for a coffee with somebody uh, and it creates those conversations that you uh, wouldn't necessarily have and I know that um, there are university I think University of Michigan do it between professors and it's created some fantastic projects out of that so that's one thing that um, I would really recommend doing um, if you use slack there's a there's a an extension um, called donut uh, everyone can join the channel it will randomly pair people. So it's something I do in one of my Slack groups. We have a channel that if people want to join it, they get paired up with someone every two weeks and have a conversation. Um, there are other things like, you know, having coffee hour, drop in, things like that. Um, the thing that I would really like to, to crack is how can you um, keep uh, that, that idea about wandering around and seeing people's boards without being bombarded with tons and tons and tons of information. Um, uh, see, Albert, Albert there talked about no dress code during video, video calls. Good. Uh, <laughs> as long as it's some dress. <laughs> <laughs> um, so finding those moments where you can say, look, we're all, or having, having a meeting and saying, we're going to meet up, but we're not allowed to talk about work. Um, and making it very specifically kind of a, a genderless, non-work-based, or even if it wanders into work, that's okay, but it's not like, I'm not coming here to deal with a problem, or we're not coming here to go through this agenda, solve this problem, and then we go out. Um, I think, so, random coffee would be my my number one recommendation there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, so some other things as well, we, we had the idea of actually having just hangouts uh, open all day for people to check in and check out of, right? Uh, so some people are getting, uh, again, these things Wall Street Journal picked up on this the other day, Zoom fatigue now, sorry, not Zoom fatigue, Slack fatigue, the idea that all you do is talk to your colleague now virtually by typing away to them. Um, and uh, while I suppose you could put, probably put the same premise about Zoom fatigue or hangout fatigue or Teams fatigue, the, the idea is is still that people should be able to do this more and have this interaction more and so having a, a hangout which is available to them all day long so they can just drop in drop out see who's available have a chat get a coffee grab a beer whatever that is um are, are those you know normal norms for us to create that sense of community have that sort of sense of purpose and feel like we're we're part of something special I would I would add to that as well for um, for leaders to to have um, a period of time where they have an open door, um, so you can do that with, <laughs> with with moments in the calendar. Or fantastic if you've ever used Whereby, which uh, used to be called Appearing, that allows you to actually someone to come and knock on your door. <laughs> you can see wow. who it is um, and let them in. So I think it's really important for uh, for anyone that looks after other people that they have, they have periods where people can reach them. And I think that it's important, like even on, on top of that as well, that when we do have our calls and meetings that are about business, that we do take a few minutes just to check in. Um, and that, again, helps you kind of be yourself. And you want to hear it. You want to hear it all. So, you know, it's better to say, how are you doing? You know, actually, I had a really bad night's sleep last night and I'm feeling a bit pants. Um, so if I drift in and out, you know, give me a prod or whatever. That's useful. When you're physically in work as well you know, because it helps give you some context about why how you know where you are don't take it personally but i'm really tired type thing so so i think that that's useful to do we t where, there seems to be a thing with human teams or whatever that because it's a, a, a virtual co call that it has to be super efficient and it's like right here we are let's get started, let's get started. whereas if you were in a real meeting room you might be more likely to have a little bit of a chat yeah so I just I think that's an important thing to do every single time is to have that kind of check in, particularly it's the beginning of the day um, and actually encourage people to say, actually, you know what, things aren't great for me. 
uh, whatever that is. I think that's just good, good practice generally. I think the web, I think, is obviously getting lots of people, Sylvester and other people, talking just in talking about whereby um, it's something that I, I'm going to have a look at after this and uh, um, see what I can use that for um, within the workplace. So brilliant. Excellent. OK, then. So another question from the audience. Um, do you believe there should be any change to the leadership communication style during the pandemic? Um, they feel they are having to repeat the same message a few times in different contexts to actually allow it to sink in. Yeah, I don't necessarily think style necessarily changes. If they're a responsible leader within the organization, their style should be open and honest and transparent anyway. Um, should they do stuff probably more frequently? Um, if they're looking after uh, members of uh, the, the, the community, the company, who are furloughed as well, how, how they need to be mindful and responsible for having those constant check-ins to see how they're doing making sure that they're still feeling part of the the community of the organization waiting for that time when economics say they can actually come back and join everybody again in the organization which will hopefully be very soon especially with all the sort of the rules and guidelines we've been given by um rishi and everybody in the mm -hmm. government um so i don't think it has to be uh, it has to change if you're in an organization, as I said, where it is responsible leadership. I just think you have to do it more open, probably more often. Um, you have to ask, actually. Uh, one of the things I did was actually ask the, the teams, what type of communication would you like? Um, I, I don't want to presume that the, the style or the type of meeting I'm going to have is actually what you need while you are sat working from home. So one of the things was actually just offering that out. Tell me how I can be that responsible leader for you and what type of comms do you want? And there'll be different things for different teams and they want different styles. Some people will only want something email, Slack, you know, something written down. There'll be other people and other teams and other parts of the community who will want this type of face-to-face -face time, to, to Emily's time, making sure that the teams have access to the leaders of the organization so that they can talk about anything that's really, you know, stopping them. So that they do feel they're operating in that space of psychological safety and ultimately trust. Is there just on that? Uh, Giles, is, is there a responsibility uh, for leaders to to make more of an effort to reach out to people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. That's that's. I think the the, the key. <clears throat> it's that it's that element of making sure you know leaders and organisations are doing it possibly more. They're going over the top. Um, but I do think you know back in the office we would have had those traditional meetings, those check-ins. To to Jenny's point we would have had the the weekly i would have had a weekly leadership meeting with my guys i would have also had weekly 30 minute one-on-ones with my um the guys who i, I look after but I, I think you're right i think we need to do something probably a bit smarter um which is why early on i offered out to them what do you want from me and i think that was the only way i do not want to sit here and presume i know what you want and how you want that information coming from the exec team coming from how you know sales or uh, the economics of covid are impacting us etc etc you know i'm the most transparent person probably sometimes brutally transparent and honest but i'll, I'll just say it as it is um you know heart and sleeve go from there so when we're talking about communication here, essentially with more people working remotely and the fact that their days may be more broken up with childcare, you know, they may not do the standard nine to five, they may work earlier or work later to account for whatever their needs are while they are actually remote. Um, do you think that this communication would be acceptable to change from more of a real time communication to a more delayed response? Normally in the office, you know, I come to you with a report I've been working on for two days show it to the manager, then they you expect a response immediately on that, which is quite unfair thinking about it from an outside view that they need to respond against something they've just looked at. With the move to remote um, and the expectation that there could be a delay from responses, do you think that would work better for, um, for businesses moving forward? I think I said, <laughs> sorry, please, Jenny. It's <coughs> useful generally to, to to allow people to respond in different ways because those of us that are extroverts and good at jumping in and making decisions quickly and able to spontaneously answer, you know, that kind of thing, 
for us. But where you, you know, most people um, prefer to contribute having digested something a bit more deliberately and having taken time. So I think what whenever we're getting, whenever we're asking for feedback or trying to get collaborative collaborations or input from people, we should be mindful of how how they, you know, how they contribute in the best way. And for some people that's giving something some some time to mull over. So and for lots of people. So I think the delayed delayed different expectations about input is useful. Um, I also I also think in terms of you talking about people working from home and reaching out, uh, it's very easy as well to um, assume that it's the same for everybody. You know, I was on a call recently where it was a beautiful day and we were talking about how much of a lovely day it was and one of us was in the garden and the other one was, uh, you know, had all the windows open and looking out at the lovely garden and um, we said to one person on the call, you know, isn't it a lovely day? You know, and, and she said, I'm in I'm in a one bedroom flat, I don't have any outside space. And you think, oh my goodness, how how um how sort of thoughtless have we been in that whole conversation without really appreciating your situation? So yeah, it, it, it's a really individual thing, isn't it? And I think it's important that um we have something in place that makes sure that there's that individual reach out and understanding of the people's circumstances. Okay, great. Um, so another question from the audience is, uh, do agile organisations work better in a COVID lockdown than non-agile organisations? If so, why? Different. <laughs> I don't, I, I genuinely, um, I, you could look at the things, you know, my place was uh, the, the senior leadership actually had a kind of thing against working from home. Um, they kind of didn't have a working from home policy, even if people like myself and, uh, and other leaders in the company would allow that to just happen because it's a part of life. It's part of everyday, you know, way of working uh, rather than having that sort of way of organizing. So f from that perspective, um, I think a lot of um, execs have kind of gone, <coughs> you know what? We, we didn't want working from home to happen because we thought everybody would be running around and doing different crazy things or not concentrating on the outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been proven wholly wrong. Um, you know, working from home is as effective, but it's different. I don't think people teams work any better. And actually looking at outcomes of time to market and other things like that as well. I mean, it's been too short a period of time. It's only been three months. Looking at psychological safety as another one, looking at sort of the team health metrics and stuff like that, the metrics that actually matter, not how many stories you're churning out on a daily basis or how many points you're completing in a week, but the key metrics that ultimately matter. They've actually stayed exactly the same pre and post and where we are in this kind of weird limbo land as we're trying to sort of come out the other side of lockdown at different phases and different stages globally. So um, I, I don't think organizations work, but I think they just work different. Um, and I think they're trying to adapt to their ways of working by being inclusive with all the, the people in the teams to make sure that, um, that they get that best way of working that best set of outcomes to be as you know let's use the word again best as possible okay. i would i think i'd add to that there's an element of I think organizations that already have a high trust environment good psychological safety and a good focus on people are going to thrive better in this kind of environment than than those that don't necessarily have have that and i think you know i've seen an organization uh recently that instead of you know working from home just meant that people were working 14 hour days instead of um normal and and all weekend because the kind of being present was online all the time or the expectations were if you're not traveling you're not online more um and that just that uh being that they, they the psychological safety and the trust isn't there in the first place it just exacerbated the issue yeah, absolutely. And okay, great. And moving on to another question from the audience as well. Um, so it's a little bit more specific. Um, for those teams that have found success with big visible charts in physical spaces, uh, could the speakers recommend any virtual alternatives that they've had success with? So uh, following a link uh, to to check a team's dashboard does seem to have a higher friction than seen it, seen it in passing in his experience. And I, I totally agree. I think it's hard to read people's boards, uh, online boards, because they're, they're usually written in code. <laughs> uh, 
um, in a way that others don't understand. Sorry, we understand what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, been, I've been surprised at how, because I've always, all of the work that I've done in terms of facilitation and training, I've very much valued people being there physically present. And so I thought um, doing that virtually would be really, really, really challenging. But so, but I've been surprised at how um, how useful Miro is, for example. Miro, 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 Miro. Yeah. Not sure what the Miro, Miro, yeah. <laughs> That's what I say, but then I get quick. So, um, so that's been much, much more successful than I expected. And so I'm, I'm noticing that people are using that more to capture their thoughts and where they are and then you and then kind of using that as a way to uh share with other people and sort of capture where they are so i mean but but for us to, to for us to sort of um go and check other people's miro boards and things like that i think requires a bit of a, a, a change in how we work um who i had a thought i had a thought um the other week uh, which i'd love someone to try out is uh, if you remember um, the show from the 70s, 80s, maybe into 90s, I'm not sure, anything to do with Tony Hart, uh, and they had the gallery, <laughs> and it would be a video of, of pictures that had been sent in. Um, I have to say, I was on the gallery once. Um, <laughs> I could always imagine like sending a sh like a show reel out of like just people's boards. <laughs> that you just go, oh, that looks interesting. I want to stop and have a chat about that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I like that. I like that idea. M Miro, Miro, I think is is the great thing. You know, I, I've been using it. My wife, wife uses it with her company as well. Um, so many people are, are using that as a tool because to 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 go to this this next one, productivity uh, that's there. We're not sat there, as I said, possibly doing with the same optics as we might have done with Jira boards and Jira burn downs and Jira burn ups as well to look at that and look at the wasting process. We're, we're set, you know, looking at some of some of it more in that world of short termism right now because we don't know what's tomorrow or next week or the week after or a month's time, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's it's looking at how we measure productivity is not now not having so much of a heavy focus on those Jira tickets. It's about can we still go and write a customer? Can we still go off and actually get successful outcomes uh, for them uh, during lockdown? Can we still produce uh, releases on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, whatever our deployment frequency is within our organization. So I think that's how we're measuring productivity. And if we just take it back, as I said, and sort of look back to what it was pre-COVID and post-COVID, it's, it's the same because people still are feeling responsible, accountable, um, feel like they have the ownership of what they're trying to create uh and are being allowed to just to crack on and get on and do it and therefore they're still delivering the same things for our customers great um and probably for jenny then so working from home during the pandemic is vastly yeah, different from the normal remote working i.e not being able to go to the coffee shop um no matter rounds do you think this will negatively affect how remote work is actually going for is going to be seen moving forward well, I'm hoping that there's some kind of happy medium out there where the good stuff about people being trusted to work from home remains where, where it is. It becomes more of a norm and that people expect it, that flexibility uh, in order to balance their lives. People expect it in, in terms of um, in terms of their jobs and that employers have to respond by making sure that flexible working is right up there. So, um you, it would be nice to have a balance, wouldn't it, where you could work from home when you needed to and go into the office for important things and to keep the communities and keep the physical presence. I mean, I've been commuting into London for 15 years. Um, I'm lucky that I've been really quite flexible in my ways of working for certainly the last five, 10 years. But there's a lady that, a lovely lady that I sit next to, and she's been commuting every single day into London, 50 minutes each way for 20 years, every single day. And she, I'd say to her, why don't you work from home? And she said, oh, my boss won't let me, you know, and, and I've been in touch with her recently and she's just feeling so refreshed from having that time at home. And then you think about all the 
all the working couples and families who pass on the stairs and who, you know, barely have time to load the dishwasher and, and all of those things, who are getting time to actually exist at home and see each other and get up a bit later and things like that. So hopefully, um, which, which is all, you know, we work way too hard, don't we, if, if you're working eight, eight in the morning till eight at night every day, it's too much. Um, so I'm hoping that there's a nice middle ground come, coming out of this, which is that our expectations in terms of flexibility and being able to manage our normal life stuff uh, is an expectation that employers have to deliver if they're going to be attractive places to work. Yeah. And that um, we, we're able to balance that with uh, regular regular contact and all the good stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do believe there's been many people, especially with smaller children, with the schools being closed, obviously had a much harder time keeping them entertained and still being able to effectively work. During normal remote working life, they would be at school. So therefore, you would have those big periods of un uninterrupted work where you could obviously be very productive. Um, so just moving on, just through my question, this will come back to the audience's question shortly because um, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, Emily, how do you see the younger generation changing the way companies uh, way companies need to work in the future? So I think I brought this up as a topic when we were talking about Generation Agile um, <laughs> and, and, and what generation uh, the, the four of us might be uh, who, are, who are on this call. And, I, and you know, we all, we've all grown up with seeing how, you know, the, the old way and the new way, <laughs> new way, um, and kind of had to break out of it, which is what, you know, is what, what Agile has been doing all along. It's been saying, you know, this is the old way. This is, we do things in the new way now. I think there's an element and of, um, and I was talking to a uh, computer science uh, professor um, just the other day, who was who was saying that, you know, with his uh, with his students, he he takes an agile approach, and so many of the, the uh, professors that he worked with uh, don't. They take a waterfall approach, and it's it would seem very confusing to me that why would you teach any anyone waterfall at this point in time when actually they're going to go out into their careers and be in, be in an agile environment. Um, so I think that the younger generation are probably more probably more suited uh, in some ways because they haven't been haven't been soiled <laughs> by the ways of the past. Um, I think the expectations. Um, and I'm thinking, thinking about this, like the expectations, uh, particularly, you know, as we've we've been we've been talking about lockdown, what that means in terms of work life balance, commuting, family, those kind of things. Um, and expectations are probably moving more towards, you know, there is a good work life balance. And then it reminded me of the whole um, idea that, uh, you know, like uh, daylight saving was created so that people could have more um, more daylight in the summer. Uh, in order to uh, spend time doing what they want, and there was a whole campaign around that that was um, eight hours, eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, eight hours to do what you please. Um, and <laughs> it felt a bit like we're almost going kind of full circle. And that was a government campaign back to this idea that actually we do need these <laughs> eight hours to do to do as we please. Um, and uh, this is where my, my mind was going with this this uh, younger generation. Actually, the younger generation are just the expectations are to get us back to that place <laughs> where we do have a work-life balance, um, as well as that. There's a kind of um, I think as as, uh, as as kind of more people think about brands and career and the way that um, there is sometimes there's this less separation of work and life, which again fits into the you know your children are on a call because um, I think someone said earlier about starting to see people's. Uh, real selves when they're at work. There's an there's an element of that blending as well, and an element of people um, expecting their careers to be multi-dimensional and to be um, to to not be linear. You know, not be uh, you don't get a job and work in it for the next twenty years. Um, so the I think the the expectations of the younger generation are that you know our, our career, careers are multifaceted and they change. That the work-life balance is really important. And that things are inherent, inherently agile just because in, in the pace of change of, of the world and the things that they see, um, which all fits nicely into, into agile, really. Okay. okay. There is actually just something to add on to that. There's a great stat, actually, um, that's out there at the moment. 60% of the 11-year-olds globally today 
uh, will be in jobs we haven't even invented yet. Mm -hmm. So to absolutely to Emily's points, th these kind of norms that, you know, my, my dad did the same job for 50 years, quite, quite literally, you know, retired in his 70s, but did it for the entire time at the same firm. Um, gone are those days anymore. You know, we have to be, you know, have to have that agility for want of using a word, especially where, you know, this this stat that's being banded around at the moment, 60% uh, uh, of these 11 year olds will be doing things we haven't even dreamt up yet. It's all very exciting. Um, okay, then. So we've heard uh, the phrase psychological safety come out a few times. So uh, Jenny, uh, could you explain a little bit what psych uh, psychological safety is and how companies can um, support psychological safety? Um, so sure, psychological safety is uh, basically about um, creating an environment where people feel safe to learn, safe to contribute, um, and ultimately safe to challenge the status quo. So um, that, that's kind of the environment that we want to create. And, it, you know, um, how do we achieve that? I think it's we've talked a lot about some of it today in terms of encouraging people to be themselves. Uh, listening is a really, 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 really important thing. So it, it means that some of us who are, are good at kind of jumping in and talking need to deliberately take a step back and, and allow people to contribute rather than constantly thinking about what we're going to say next and how we're going to contribute. Um, we need to appreciate that um, people collaborate um, uh, very differently and have different needs, that we're all wired differently, we all have different perceptions of the, of the world around us and different values, so the better we seek to understand each other and understand ourselves will help us um, relate to each other and, and ultimately get the best out of ourselves and each other. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is, is an organisational thing about trust. So being being able to challenge the status quo is something that has to be instilled from the top, you know, that, that you actually invite that feedback two ways. Um, and because organisations make big mistakes if they don't, if they don't uh, have the contribution from people to say i think that, you know that's making a bad decision and there's that wonderful collective intelligence that we have available to us to inform our decisions so there's the, you know there's the, the trust culture in terms of um making sure that people really can fail make mistakes um do things wrong be human and challenge without fear of some kind of um you know, some kind of bad effect on them or some limiting um, some limiting outcome. So, yeah, there's there's a lot to it. And I'm, I'm sure Emily's got some stuff to add. I think you covered a lot of it. The one the one thing I would just add is around motivation. And there's a there's you can see a psychologically safe environment because people are motivated to work there because they feel valuable. And the, the counter side of that is people that are demotivated and don't care about the work that they do um, because they're not in a safe environment. Sure. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, outside of the tech community, I see a lot of that where the manager comes along, says, ask questions, challenge me. But then um, you hear back say, well, I asked the question. They got annoyed that I kept on asking questions and snapped at me. So therefore, I don't do it anymore. So, yeah, it's definitely something that it's great to see more instilled inside the tech community. But it's a shame it's not, you know, further reaching outside into other industries inside uh, the UK, especially. Um, so, uh, Emily, uh, what are communities of practices? Um, so, I think this is uh, this is communities of practice very relevant for for agile organisations because it's about connecting people um, that do the same thing, so that they can learn from each other um, and they can improve things uh, for themselves. So, if we take something like if we take multidisciplinary teams, often we have folk that uh, maybe you're a designer, maybe you're the only designer on your team. You're not connected to any other designers in the organization. It's about connecting those folk up so that they can make design be the best that it can be uh, in that organization. And it's with lots of stuff that we've touched on, um, including things like you know psychological safety, in, including collaboration. 
um, including trust, uh, comes through these these kind of non-hierarchical uh, communities of people that, that do the same thing, that care about the same thing, and that continue to make that make it better as they connect um, and learn regularly. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> All right, then. So, sorry, I could sure. talk about this as a practice for hours, uh, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, going back to the audience question, then, before I go through my last few, um, so not really a working from home related question, but um, essentially, one of the uh, Chris, he's um, he's a consultancy company with multiple departments, so sales, marketing, engineering, design, and data science. And obviously with multiple projects, fixed deadlines and um, for time and cost of customers, communication between departments needs to be improved. Obviously he's finding with some processes to be put in place. How do we implement agile in this type of situation? That's, that's a good question. Um, and uh, one which really goes back to the whole sort of premise and idea of true business agility. Um, and there's there's a lot of people now really talking in, in this space more than specifically uh, you know actual physical processes with methodologies or frameworks of particular types of agile we're using. It's about how we relate and bring that mindset to all of those parts of an organisation. You know, it, it's I've had successes in trying to change mindsets around HR departments previously, where you know I hate, as I've previously mentioned, the idea that somehow we are um, recognized in the same ways as desks and chairs and computers as we all do. So we're not, right? It should be people management. And as such, um, from that people management perspective, um, you know, we are uh, very much um, uh, able to change the, the ways of thinking within the organization currently uh, and do things a lot smarter um and be be more open as well so from how we implement this across all parts of an organization um it's about trying to look at doing some value stream mapping is what is one of the key areas trying to eliminate waste in process by trying to look through where are all the things that are lim limiting how successfully the handoff and the trade over between different parts of our processes uh, are actually happening, especially while we're locked down. We should always be revisiting our ways of working. We should always be revisiting our value stream mapping processes um, uh, within our organizations to continually refine them, continually look at improving those, <coughs> um, those outcomes uh, and those trade offs. So for me, communication, yeah, we know it's probably the number one thing and having the right leaders in place to be able to perform that is the number one thing organizations need during lockdown and as we move out of it. But for me, it's continually evolving, continually having those conversations of how can we interact smarter? How can we actually do our value stream mapping better to generate the, the, the right outcomes? So I would, if, I, if you don't mind me just kind of jumping in, I'd say, um, as well, one thing that I noticed working with organisations is that, um, you know, they that go agile or whatever they're doing, um, there's a temptation to kind of impose a process or a framework or something like that in order to, to solve the problems. Where normally, um, you know, one of the real benefits, the key benefits of, of agile is supposed to be that by breaking down these silos and these handovers, you get that good collaboration where you get less rework and more effective more effective teams working on high value stuff so mm. i think that the first thing to do is just have conversations with people um, uh, bring people together recognize that you have uh, you know different departments that that might feel quite isolated and just outside of any kind of framework or label or jargon or way of working have a proper conversation about how you um, break down those barriers and get people working together more effectively, whether that's having more regular cross um, team catch ups, whether it's making sure that the right people are involved in decisions early enough, whether it's about thinking of more interesting ways to engage people and to collaborate properly. So I would always start there um, and try and facilitate that better collaboration between the teams before uh, before reading a book about it or, or trying to adopt a particular framework or anything like that would be my advice. Great. It's a good well, comment in the, in the point, uh, team health checks and retros. 
a uh, good way to share thoughts as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I 100 percent agree with that. I would uh, just add, um, but if you are thinking about a book, there's, there's some great work that uh, Alex Pentland, who professor at MIT, has done around a concept called social physics. Um, this was a book that came out uh, quite a few years ago, and it basically talks about the fact that organizations where people talk to each other are more successful than organizations where people don't talk to each other. And they did a whole bunch of mapping out um, how how communication happened in organizations and showing things like silos of departments. Um, and it's really interesting just, you know, just to get that. Um, there is some research backing up the fact that people just talking to each other is really important. Sometimes that is that seren serendipitous moment. And uh, just um, having empathy, I always think that empathy is, is kind of the antithesis of silos. So if you are talking to other people and you get to understand them as people, it breaks down that those that team over there or that department over there or that bunch of amorphous, homogenous group of people that don't have names or families or feelings <laughs> over there is really kind of siloed behavior. But actually just finding opportunities for people to talk to each other starts to really help with, with when you actually need to collaborate on work. Excellent. And my final question as we're coming to an end here is uh, probably for Emily first then. So what does career development look like moving forward? Um, so I have this, it's very interesting. I've been in, uh, got into a few organizations and, and talked about what their career development framework looks like. Uh, and very often um, HR and I agree it should be the people department. I don't, don't like the R word when we talk about people. Um, uh, want this very kind of succinct, you start as a junior, you go through this, you go through this, you go through this. And when you turn around to them and say, tell me about your career, was it like that? They're like, oh, no, 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 my career wasn't like that. I started here and then I moved here and then I did this and then I did this. Um, and <laughs> that's kind of kind of really key because I, I would assume that um, all of us here sitting, the, the four of us sitting here and many of the people that are listening that don't have linear uh, career <laughs> frameworks. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, organizations often try and kind of force people into that uh, linear career development framework. And so it's always good to think of us as kind of, we talk about T-shaped, but it's more than that. It's more than pie-shaped. I heard someone talking about comb-shaped uh, a while back, that we have these kind of multifaceted um, skills and capabilities that when, when we bring folk together that have these kind of blurred edges, they, make, they can make fantastic teams. Um, and I would really uh, like to see organizations uh, rewarding um, learning outside of your core uh, set of uh, capabilities that, that go with the role that you've been given. Um, and I think, I think that's where the, the blur and edges is where that's going. And I think it's, um, I, I think it's going to become more about like the self. Um, so some of my kind of best career development has been understanding what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, possibly know, can you, when you're starting out, you can't really possibly know what you're gonna, what you're gonna really enjoy and where you're gonna really thrive. And, um, and so historically in terms of career management and career development and um, interpersonal skills and all of that stuff, we tend to focus on making ourselves well-rounded and addressing all of our weaknesses. Whereas there's loads of research that shows that we're much, much better off trying to get better at things we're already naturally good at and giving the stuff that we're not good at to somebody else who's good at that stuff. So and that's quite aside from, you know, you could you could go out thinking, I want to be, I want to be this kind of career. I want to go and do this kind of career. But actually, if you're not an analytical person or you're not a detailed person, you know, you're never gonna excel in that thing. So I'd like I'd like um, young people to do more work to think about what they're naturally good at when they're in the zone, when they feel in the stretch zone, and what it is that's happening. Are, are they are they um, doing visual imagery stuff? Are they are they unwrangling complex problems? Are they you know what is it that that their brain is enjoying doing? And once you kind of appreciate that, then you're much better set to know how to. Uh, avail of those personal strengths that you have um, because a lot of our a lot of that is based on our personality and our DNA to a significant extent you know you can you can demonstrate somebody's 
creative um, or kind of um, curiosity type uh, approach or outlook or mindset in their DNA. Um, so I'd really like young people to spend more time doing that and also learning about each other so that they can just navigate the world. I think <laughs> so, one, one thing just to sort of, to, sort of to, to add on top of that, I think one of the the key challenges, especially around career, and that's the you know the, the number the the question, is the fact that um, what we're not doing very well is especially universities. And to, to Emily's earlier point, you know, when I went to university, I went to me how long ago that was. You know, I was taught requirements capture waterfall development processes, um, everything that goes, that goes with that. And um, the one thing that I'm still finding out now, and I'm looking at universities and some of their software engineering degrees, the same that I did, um, they're still talking about that sort of requirements capture up front. They're still talking about waterfall and other types of software engineering methodologies. What they're not talking about in a lot of courses is the agile mindset, the philosophy, the set of values that we need to be bringing to our organizations. So. I was speaking at a career event, an agile career chat, very similar to this two Fridays ago, lunchtime as well, uh, and, and talking to some people who were trying to say, well, you know, how do we further our agile career? Um, they've been hired as uh, project managers or delivery managers, <coughs> excuse me, titles which still have this sort of vernacular of the word manager in the title, and yet, They've been asked to be a project manager with uh, who, who is a qualified scrum master. Well, what are you? Are you a scrum master or are you a project manager? They, they are two different roles. Are you a delivery manager, which is some hybrid weird thing between the two as well, right? Or are we actually looking to hire agile coaches to come into organizations to help you know teams and uh, organizations just work smarter and work a lot easier together and help remove the friction in process? And I would say the answer is yes. But what we're not doing is we're not coming out of universities with degrees in agile. I mean, they, 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 we can't. I mean, it's just crazy at the moment. But there is no reason why, as part of other degrees, whether they are psychology degrees, sociology degrees, engineering degrees, uh, any of these other things, that organizations who are, or sorry, individuals who aspire to then be within an organization like the ones we operate in, where agile is a very large part of what we are being every day within the organization, that they are not taught that mindset uh, during you know their courses as well. And I see things on LinkedIn occasionally where a lecturer will be, I'm doing a, a set of you know lectures at I know, Kingston University, University of London or something like that. And the idea is, is that somehow um, that's going to be great, and that one lecture that on their on their circuit tour they're going to do is be brilliant for them to uh, suddenly aspire to be agile. But it, it's wrong. We need to do a lot more than that. I think it's. I also think it's less about being taught, but more about being untaught, because uh, you know uh, much younger children are inherent inherently agile, but that's take that's taught out of them. Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, today's uh, conversation has been fantastic. Uh, it's great for us to finish on that topic there, because I think that's a really interesting area to consider the people that we're advising, especially when they're trying to get into this industry, what to focus on, what to look at. And also, as um, Jenny mentioned, you know, what to find out what they actually enjoy. So uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Giles, Emily and Jenny for talking with us today. It's been fantastic. You can connect with our speakers after this event on the links of the show and in the chat now. So there's their Twitter, there's their websites, all there. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.